You're listening to part four of Baptists and Religious Liberty by Dr. Rudy Gonzalez. But I'd like to focus just for a moment on John Leland. He was born a Congregationalist from Massachusetts, moves to Virginia where he embraced, I'm sorry, embraces Baptist, uh, the Baptist faith and moves to Virginia and serves as a minister uh, in the state of Virginia, which in his day, uh, <clears throat> the Church of England, or rather, the Anglican Church was the state church for that, uh, for that colony. Uh, he was very influential in, uh, in uh, going to the state legislature, seeking redress and, and uh, appealing uh, against uh, atrocities and persecutions and beatings and whippings and imprisonments uh, against not just Baptists but dissenters because they didn't uh, fall in line with the state Anglican Church. He was very much involved in all of that. But I want us to, to understand that it is really after the Revolutionary War when, when Leland truly shines. Because once uh, the American colonies gained their freedom and their liberty, there was of course uh, the push to, to bring forth a, a constitution. And this constitution was written by the founding fathers and it had to be ratified in the, in the 13 uh, slate, uh, states that now existed. Well, <clears throat> in the state of Virginia, Baptists were divided into rats and anti-rats. A rat was somebody that was for the ratification of the proposed constitution, and an anti-rat was somebody who was against uh, the ratification at the state level of the constitution that was being proposed. John Leland was an anti-rat. He had his misgivings about uh, the proposed constitution, believing that it didn't go far enough to guarantee uh, the freedom of religion that Baptists so much desired and wanted. And so he began uh, politicking against the ratification of the constitution at the state level in the state of Virginia. Uh, Interestingly enough, uh, James Madison, uh, who we all know is a, is a father, uh, is, a, is a founding father of our nation, came to visit John Leland. And uh, we are told that they spent a considerable amount of time, the better part of a day, uh, discussing matters. We don't know what all those matters were, but we can suspect that this whole concept of religious liberty came very much to the forefront in their discussions. Anyway, at the end of the day, Leland dropped his opposition to the, to the, to the Constitution, rallied along with Madison for the support of the Constitution, was able to, to rally uh, Baptists in Virginia to support the ratification of the Constitution, and of course that's what happened. And then of course in 1792, the, the Constitution was ratified at the, at the national level. And so we have uh, a Constitution. But what's going to follow next? Madison must have been a man of his word because immediately upon the founding of the Constitution at the federal level, within a day or two, he begins uh, politicking uh, for amendments to the Constitution, what would be the Bill of Rights which would be adopted in 1792. I'm sorry, I had my dates adopted. The Constitution was adopted in 1789, the Bill of Rights in 1792. And so we have the very first amendment. Congress shall make no law respect, respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. thereof. The first amendment in the Bill of Rights. This shows that the establishment clause keeps government from favoring any one religion, and the free exercise clause of this First Amendment keeps government from harming any religion directly. The fact that freedom of religion is at the very forefront of the Bill of Rights and the First Amendment shows just how important it was for Madison, Jefferson, as it was uh, for Leland and others. Well, what have people said about Baptists and this struggle for religious liberty or freedom of conscious, 
conscience through the years. John Locke, who was a British empiricist philosopher, said, the Baptists were the first propounders of absolute liberty, just and true liberty, equal and impar impartial liberty. George Bancroft who, is a Bancroft, who is an American historian, said, freedom of conscience, unlimited freedom of mind, was from the first the trophy of the Baptists. John Quincy Adams, who is the son of John Adams and the sixth uh, president of the United States, considered Baptists to be the most thorough religious reformers of all time. And J.M. Dawson, who, is, who was the director of the J.M. Dawson Inst Institute of Church State Studies, said, if the researchers of the world were to be asked who was the most responsible for the American guarantee of religious liberty, their prompt reply would be James Madison. But if James Madison might answer, he would quickly reply, John Leland and the Baptists. Truly, as we think about all of this, uh, the Anabaptists and the Baptists have, have uh, a lesson to teach us all today. Why were they willing to sacrifice so much for this idea of, uh, of a church separate from, from the ligatures and the dictates of the state. Why was that so important from, for them? I think we ought to learn the lessons that they learned along the way as well. For one, they understood that the marriage of the church and the state corrupted the very character of the church as an ecclesia. The term ecclesia is a Greek term which means those who are called out. But if the church is, is basically blended with the state, that whole concept of ecclesia comes into question. They believed that Christians were those whom God had called out through the preaching of the gospel to be the pure bride of Christ before society as a witness to society and not in complete and total uniformity with society. They also understood that the mandating of infant baptism, so much so that at the point of your baptism, you don't just become a member of uh, society, but you become a member of, the, of Christendom, of the, of the Catholic, the universal church, so to speak. This, uh, this erased the very idea of evangelism and missions. After all, if everybody is a Christian, Christian because we live under the dome of this uh, Christendom ideal, then whom do you evangelize? Whom do you disciple? Who do you reach out to uh, with the gospel? It followed, therefore, that when they come to understand that, that entry into the church is through, is through the ability to think for oneself and accept for oneself uh, the, 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 the message, the life-saving message of Jesus, that that brought you into the body of Christ, then that uh, recovered the concept of, of evangelism and missions uh, for all time. So for Anabaptists and Baptists, the preservation of the right articulation of the, gasp, of the gospel could only happen if the church remained separate from the state, the state and distinct from society. Thus they wrote confessions of faith to articulate their beliefs to those who would embrace uh, their teachings and their, and their biblical teachings. Thus they wrote tracts to present their convictions, their ideas about true Christianity before the arena of public opinion. Thus they formed grievance committees to petition the kings and the magistrates for a fair hearing for their beliefs and redress from injustices perpetrated against, against them. And thus they worked with political figures of goodwill to enact and bring uh, to the, the legislature uh, religious liberty uh, for all uh, people. We might ask today, <clears throat> well, are we just going to rest on our laurels as Baptists? Do we just look back and say, man, God sure used us in a great and powerful way and, uh, and let's just let that uh, be all that we have to contribute to the world. I would argue that we as Baptists have a tremendous responsibility 
to continue to, to put forth the ramifications that flow from a robust belief that people ought to be free to practice the religion according to the dictates of their conscience. So we ask, what does religious liberty, what does freedom of conscience have to do with a baker refusing to fill an order that violates his personal religious convictions? Or what does it have to do with the use of public money to finance private religious schools? Are there issues of religious liberty involved with that? Or what about the use of sacred texts for teaching in the public uh, classrooms as we have seen uh, practiced even, uh, even today? Or what does religious liberty have to say about a religious celibate order which is mandated by the state to provide contraception to its members? These are all questions that, uh, that in one way or another uh, uh, impact uh, this country and our understanding of religious liberty. And what about from a broader perspective, the oppression of all religions worldwide? As for example, the oppression today of uh, Muslim communities in China. We could, we could identify other groups, uh, what is happening in Nigeria and so many other places around the world. What do Christians have to say about, uh, about the right of people regardless of where they find themselves, to have this fundamental freedom to express their religion in any way that they see fit. Let me just say in conclusion that, uh, that Baptists uh, have something uh, to be proud of in, uh, in past history, but we have a responsibility moving forward to uh, maintain a free church, to be vigilant, uh, especially in the courtrooms and in the legislature, and in the public square informing people of just how important it is to be able to express our religious convictions zealously to persuade, but never to coerce, never to demand, never to take away anybody else's right to persuade people with respect to their own religious convictions. In, this, in, in its initial drive, uh, the question was really very simple, right? In light of the fact that that uh, that the church-state model, the magisterial model, prevailed over the whole of the Western world, and the uh, and the appeal was really quite stark and simple: give us the freedom to worship God as we please. But we live in a more nuanced world today, right? The world is more complex, nuanced, and today we live in a secular multi multicultural society. I would say that uh, we as Baptists, our work has only uh, just begun. So I'd like to leave you with, uh, with uh, two passages of scripture, Hebrews 13, seven and Philippians 4, nine. Hebrews 13, seven. Remember those who led you, who spoke the word of God to you and considering the result of their conduct, imitate their faith. Philippians 4.9, the things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. I hope that this uh, very brief overview has been uh, helpful to you. Uh, hopefully it'll prompt uh, uh, ideas that maybe uh, are uh, beginning to germinate uh, in your mind and in your thinking. And uh, if I can be of help uh, to you in any way, uh, there is my contact information for you to contact me. I'd love to have a discussion with you about this. Would love to go to your church, perhaps to, uh, to whatever the venue might be. If these are important matters for us today, then if I can be of, of any service, would like to be able to do that in English, or in Spanish. Thank you for taking the time to stick with me through this presentation, and I hope that the Lord blesses you today. Thank you.